a bridge we are all familiar with. In fact, many of us have crossed this bridge. It's a beautiful bridge. It's bright and well lit. It's paved and smooth. And everyone you know has crossed this bridge or they'll soon be crossing it after you. And it's a great experience crossing this bridge. You have parties in your honor, gifts. There's people there to help you plan every step of the way. And if anything, there's an overwhelming amount of support and choices. But the best part about this bridge is where it's leading you to. It's leading you to the land of the perfect life. The land of the perfect life feels safe and secure. It's the place where you have a partner by your side. And with that, maybe the ability to buy a home, have children, pets, and a whole new level of tax benefits. <laughs> In the land of the perfect life, you're married. But many of us know the reality does not necessarily match this perception of perfection in our minds. And for some, it looks nothing like it. There may be daily fighting, tears, a constant tension in the house, and most of all, a sense of loss of yourself a little bit more every day. The factoid we've all heard stands true in research. Nearly 50% of all marriages end in dissolution. So where does the 50% go when they no longer fit in the land of the perfect life and they need to leave? Well, they're not so lucky because there's another bridge that you need to cross in exodus of the perfect life and it looks nothing like the bridge that you crossed to get in. This bridge is old and rickety, no guardrails to hold on to, and only big enough for you to cross it alone. Far worse is what you're looking at on the other side. You picture a land that's dried up, desolate, isolated, and just overall depressing. And when you think about the people that live in that land, you wonder, why are they there? What happened? What's wrong with them? But perceptions aside, in your own mind, you have broken your family and you are a failure. Back in 2014, I was living in the land of the perfect life. I was married, a newly minted suburbanite. I have a three-year-old, beautiful three-year-old daughter living in a home we had spent nearly a year renovating. It was everything I had wanted on the outside. But on the inside, my marriage was crumbling. We kept reaching for milestones where we felt things had to and needed to get better, and they didn't. Around this time, I had started seeing a therapist and we were in her office one day, and I have a memory, one of those memories where you can picture all of the details around it, where we were sitting, what she was wearing, and the look on her face when she said, have you considered getting a divorce? And I remember thinking, how could she say that? I would never do that to my family. I could never do that to my daughter. What would work think? What would the neighbors think? But as time went on, and as we slowly checked off every traditional method of trying to save our marriage, they, we finally got to the point where I knew there were no more milestones that we could set and where everything would be okay. We were going to have to face the inevitable and cross that bridge and head to a land that neither of us wanted anything to do with. And I felt scared and ashamed. But my journey took a few turns that I did not anticipate, and it led me to a land that actually looked nothing like that dried up, sad place that I had envisioned in my mind. The first curve in the road, I traced back to a day right around when all of this was happening, and I was walking through the airport quickly when I was on a work trip, and as I was walking past the Hudson News, something caught my eye. And I stopped, and I walked up, and picked up the cover, of an, uh, the cover of the Us Weekly magazine. And on the cover was Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin with a big tear down the middle. And I remember thinking, oh, Gwyneth is going through this too. Like, we are gonna go through this together. <laughs> and bigger yet, well, how are, I can't believe they have to leave the land of the perfect life, and how are they doing it? And while this cover and this story basically made fun of them for coining a new cheesy term for divorce, I was fascinated. And so then I dove into the Goop website with a vengeance. 
I read about their desire to keep their family as a unit while they themselves would no longer be a couple. And before this, all I knew of, was, of divorce was that you each get a lawyer, you start duking it out, and everything is miserable and terrible for the rest of your life. That article served as a guidepost for us to navigate through our own experience in a more positive way. And it really fundamentally changed the way that we approached our situation. The second area came around figuring out where to live and figuring it out fast. Our house sold the day it went on the market and the buyers wanted an early close. And I was like, where am I gonna live? So I started looking through places and it really sent me to an all-time low. The places that were in my single mom price range was pretty gut-wrenching to see after putting all the blood, sweat, and tears into the renovation of our home. And I had moved into our home feeling that was the place that my daughter was going to grow up in. On the day I was signing a lease for an apartment that I didn't even like, a community email came into my inbox. And as I searched through, there was a house in it that needed renters. It was beautiful, newly renovated, much too big for my daughter and I. But an idea struck. I approached a friend of mine who was also recently divorced with a three-year-old daughter. And I said something like, look at this amazing house. Could you imagine living here? And I mean, this could be ridiculous, but what if we live there together? I mean, who would do that? Uh, but as we talked through it, the idea became less and less ridiculous to us. And we decided, well, hey, what if we try this for a year? And that was three years ago. And the last three years have been the most rewarding, fun, and meaningful years of my life. But I wanted to understand how and why it was so different from that land I had pictured in my mind. And I knew it was more than just having a great living situation and being able to co-parent successfully. It was something that I felt differently about. So after some soul searching, I figured out that the reason that it was so different is because I no longer equated the end of my marriage with failure. I had somewhere along the line made an unconscious decision to flip what I thought was a failure into an opportunity to create another perfect life. But I wanted to know more because all I saw around me were women and couples that were struggling with that failure and that shame. So I started doing research and I've spent the last three years reading, talking to women in the community and across the country and I found that there is a common theme that women who have been able to navigate through in a more positive and solutions-oriented mindset share. And the common theme is this. You focus on the things that you can control and you let go of the things that you can't. You are the one who is in charge of defining your experience. But how do you begin to define an experience that you want nothing to do with and you know nothing about? Where do you even start? Well, these days when you're not sure how to do something and you need some answers, what do you turn to? Google, you got it. <laughs> but in some cases, and especially with this case, it's not as easy as typing in a couple search terms and finding some clarity on the other end. In many areas of our lives, we turn to role models and mentors. We do this in sports, in our jobs, in careers, in school. So why not in divorce? The first thing that you need to do is figure out what is important to you, and then you can find someone who shares some of those same values. And you, your experience is very unique, and you may think, I don't think I know anyone who has gone through a divorce that looks like they share any of my same values. But sometimes when you start looking and listening for things and talking, you find you have more in common with people that are out there. And even if you can't find one person, you sometimes are able to look at a lot of different situations, whether you know them personally or you see them virtually. And you take a little bit of good from everyone's situation and you mold it together and you define an experience of what looks like success for you. It might be looking at a woman who was not working and she went back to school and is now has a job and is earning significant income. Or maybe it's a woman that was left high and dry, but she puts a smile on her face and is able to co-parent successfully. 
you figure out what you value, you find someone who shares those same values and emulate them. And maybe one day you can become a mentor for someone else. The next area is around opening our minds to the trends and changes that are happening in the world around us. There are so many things in our lives that are changing so fast that it blows our minds. Some things are so different than they were 10 years ago or two years ago, even two months ago. But divorce is definitely not one of those things. The stigma around what divorce is like and how terrible it is is almost ingrained into our brains. This stigma is a primary contributor to that failure mindset. The world and how we live in it is changing fast and women have more education, opportunity, and information at our fingertips. We can tap into this technology and the trends to help us build resources, simplify our lives, and connect to others like us. How can divorce get with the times? Well, one example is looking at how and where we live. And while I fell into the opportunity to live with a friend and rent a home, co-living is actually become, is a rising trend in the United States and across the world. In some countries like Japan, it's an established way to live for some singles. Startups are jumping on this notion that they can create better living through convenience and community and are building communal homes. Traditional housing is built on the antiquated notion of individuality and the suburban American dream. But what if we look at housing that is designed around the notion and our fundamental needs for community and social interaction? The communal homes can help with splitting expenses, maintaining a lifestyle, and providing that community. All three things are so important when we are going through tough times in our lives. Another example of getting with the times is that we are living in what they call the gig economy. Side hustles are becoming the new norm with bringing opportunity for additional income at our fingertips. Driving, blogging, renting things out, selling things on Etsy. They're all ways that you can shape things around your lifestyle and things you enjoy doing and that you're good at. These are just two examples of some things that are available to us now that weren't available to us 20 years ago. Being able to just simply know that they exist can help us shape a different definition of how we approach our next chapter. The third area is around rebuilding our community. And what I mean by community is simply your friend circle and the people that you surround yourself with. Because rest assured, this will get shaken up if you go through a divorce, and it's something you just have to be prepared for. I remember a time shortly after our divorce when I sent a text message to a group of moms to have a play date. And no one responded, but I didn't think anything of it. And a few days later, I sent another text, and again, no response. And I had this silly aha moment where I thought, my phone has been so slow and wonky, I need to restart it. And sure enough, when I turned my phone back on, the text messages did not come flooding in as I was expecting them to. And I felt really sorry for myself, and I spent a couple days shedding some tears, and I decided that it was high time to change my own narrative, and it was time to reshape my circle. I was going to focus on the relationships that I felt good about and not focus on the ones that made me feel bad or brought in negativity. And I'd reconnect with friends I had lost touch with and then I was gonna dig deep and make some new friends. And I, liked it, I liken it to the wardrobe refresh of the early 2000s to 2017. <laughs> because you may need to go in there and dig through that closet and pull out all those pairs of express work pants that were the foundation <laughs> of your wardrobe but you need to hold on to that one pair of pants from Theory that fits you really well. <laughs> and then, slowly and deliberately, you add back in new pieces, pieces of high quality that fit you well and make you feel confident in who you are. Reshaping your community is a really cool area because you have some control here. You're the one in charge, and you're in the driver's seat of who you surround yourself with. But it's not a passive area. 
it might take you talking to more people than you normally would and being a little bit vulnerable, asking the moms at school for coffee or trying to host a party and then praying that people show up. But it can be a fundamental change in how you live your life and how you feel. Simon Sinek has said, before we can build the world we want to live in, we have to imagine it. So now, I want you to imagine it, imagine this. There is no bridge that the 50% has to cross to leave the land of the perfect life. Rather, we stay in the land of the perfect life and we redefine how we live in it. We do this by following positive role models, tapping into the trends and technology around us to help us maintain a quality of life, and reshaping the neighbors who surround us to provide more support and meaning in our lives. I believe that when you change your perception, you can change your experience. And this is one experience that is ready for a change. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.